Hi folks, Rich Folley. We are back at AWP 2017. This is PBS Book View Now, and I'm sitting right now with Monica Yoon, who's the author of this wonderful collection of poems, Black Acre. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Black Acre for me was very challenging uh, when I was reading through it. it you bring to it uh, a sense of the law, and, mm -hmm. and Black Acre is a, is a legal term. Why don't we start with you explaining, first of all, what Black Acre means for those who don't know, and I was one of those people. Oh, sure, no, I mean, I think it's, it's funny because it's one of those words that everyone who has, went to law, who has gone to law school knows, and no one who has not gone to law school knows. Um, it's a, uh, a hypothetical placeholder term for a piece of land. So you say John Doe for a hypothetical person, you say Black Acre for a hypothetical piece of property. So, so every single law school exam in like property or trust in the states will be like, John Doe transfers his property Black Acre to Jane Roe in exchange for her property White Acre, and then it's bordered by Green Acre and Brown Acre and Red Acre and so and so. But the idea of the acres for you, the Green Acres, that all the different colors, and you added a few colors into, yeah, um, represent for you something about potential and, and what can happen. I mean, I was thinking, I think quite a bit about. Legacy, you know, it used to be that land was thought of as property and, um, and you know, you kind of dealt with the land that you were given. Like if it was a rocky piece of land, a uh, stony piece of land, you were never going to grow, oh, I don't know, tomatoes on it. If you, you know, if it was a, if it was a, you know, a swampy piece of land, there were certain kinds of structures you couldn't build. Like, and so in doing this book, I was thinking about like, what is it that we're given to what extent can we transform that? Can we make it our own? But to what extent does it remain just what we are given? Yeah. Uh, there were some personal elements that influenced the book too. Yeah. Um, what came first for you? The concept of Black Acre and the concept of the, that sort of legal term and applying it to larger ideas? Mm -hmm. Or some of the personal elements that started to drive the backbone of these poems? Well, I think, you know, the book, if there was one subject matter that prevails in the book, it's definitely infertility. Uh, I was diagnosed with premature ovarian failure. Uh, uh, it, it apparently happened to me at a very young age while I was uh, still in my 20s. Um, and so, you know, going through menopause about 30 years uh, early was, was, a, hor was a strange discovery angry. for me. Uh, and I was trying to figure out a way to talk about that. And... I'm very uncomfortable writing directly from experience in poetry. I mean, I can do so in other forms of writing, essay, for example. But I was looking for something that could transform that experience. And I thought, well, thinking of this through the lens of, you know, this field, this barren field that you were given and what do you do with it, uh, seemed to enable me to, to write the poems that follow. A lot of the poems deal with sort of your own, it felt like the, your own shame or your own, um, um, uncomfortableness with what was happening to you. Yeah, I think a lot. The book is not so much about medically what was happening to me. The book was a lot more about, uh, you know. And I wrote the book when I was pregnant. We finally went through the egg donor process, and uh, and I have a son now who's the joy of my life. And you know, when I was pregnant, I was actually quite happy. You know, I could see what was happening in my body. My body was responding normally, and I was thinking, well, why did I just, my husband and I just put ourselves through the past five years of, you know, increasingly desperate infertility treatments. Uh, and so much of what I thought about then, the answer to me was shame, was the shame that surrounds infertility. And I was trying to find the roots of that shame. And part of those roots are in property law, because if, you know, if John Doe wants Black Acre to go to John Doe Jr., John Doe has to ensure that Jane Doe is fertile, is faithful, it, and so there's been this whole kind of system of legal and social controls to ensure the faithfulness and the fertility of women, and you find women who are infertile, aging, unfaithful to be devalued in the society. And, you know, you hear all of these words like cougar and old maid and, you know, um, slut. Um, and they're all ways of controlling women's bodies just as much as laws are ways of controlling women's bodies. And so I was thinking of why did it take me so long just to admit, like, look, I can't have a baby. Uh, I'm, you know, that's genetically mine, but I can still be a parent. I can still be a mother. You know? did, did, when you're working through these poems, I mean, is it like personal therapy for you? Is it something where you, you approach it 
trying to sort of address this feeling that you're having inside and needing to get it out? Or are you thinking about an audience when you're writing it? Uh, I think probably more the first than the second, although there is a little bit of the second um, as well. Like I try never entirely to lose the audience when I'm writing. I often think of uh, writing like a form of choreography and you know, and you think is the medium of the poem like the words, is it the page or is it in some ways the reader's mind? And when I write, I think, okay, what do I want the reader's mind to do here? Do I want the reader's mind to jump? And if they're going to jump, how do they land that jump? How do I make sure I don't completely lose them? Uh, but I think each, uh, each writer approaches this in his or her own way. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm somebody who's always thinking, okay, my ideal reader, would my ideal reader be able to get this? Um, there's, a, there's a structure to, to law oh, yeah. and legal writing, and mm -hmm. there's a formality to legal writing and law. And you wrote something, or I saw in an interview that said, I feel like I'm always trying to find a shape that will withstand the pressure of silence. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, from your legal background and writing background, what does that mean exactly to you? You know, I'm not somebody who's ever taken the ability to speak or the idea that people want to read me or people want to listen to me for granted. Uh, and I think especially my legal training, you know, you always have to justify every word that you're introducing in law. Uh, you, you know, you bill your time in six minute increments, you're given, you know, five pages and no more to write a brief. And so every word has to justify itself in some way, either in terms of money or in terms of argument. And, um, and so I tend to think that like, you know, how is, how am what I'm doing, what makes this worth doing? What makes it new? What makes it something that hasn't been done before? What makes it more than simple self-indulgence? Um, and is there a way in which I could, you know, and I think the shape thing has something to do with it. I mean, what, what shape can this take? You know, you used to do those, uh, those high school of science experiments where you would drop an egg off the, uh, off the high school gymnasium or whatever, right. and you would have to build something out of See, like drinking straws break, and, right. yeah, and popsicles and whatever. Um, and so I tend to think about that, like the egg is my idea and what shape can I build around this particular idea that will hold it together um, against, I don't know, against contrary interpretations, against uh, the reader's inattention, um, you know, and I, and I like that problem. I like thinking about constructing things. Yeah, that's really cool. There's mm -hmm. a like, formality to that too. Mm -hmm. You also, um, you know, there's themes that come through some of these poems. Yeah. Milton shows up a lot in your yeah. poem. There was the, uh, the notion of the hanged man. There's a lot, yeah. lot of series. I, looked, I didn't know about Francois Villon's uh, yeah. poem. Can you talk a little bit about how these poems affect you yeah. and how they make their way in such a prominent way into your stories? Sure. I mean, the hanged man thing, I mean, the hanged man is a trope that comes up all over the place. So there's uh, Francois Villon's poem, which is a 15th century French poem. I learned it in high school. And there are basically these men, they've been hanged. They're already dead. It's very Game of Thrones. And they're sort of on the gallows in the town square and birds have eaten parts of them and they're sort of leathery and they're not in particularly good shape. And, um, and every once in a while, they kind of reflect on their punishment and they ask the forgiveness of their townspeople and of God. And so this kind of, this space to consider your life uh, and to ask for forgiveness or to express remorse was very interesting to me. And it also tied into another trope of the hanged man, which is the tarot card hanged man. Um, when I was writing the hanged man poems, that part of the book was right after, I didn't realize I was infertile for a long time because I had been on the birth control pill, which masked the symptoms. And so once I got married and got off the pill, uh, you know, my husband and I went about trying to have a baby. And, you know, and the initial diagnosis that I just, I couldn't, uh, uh, was hard and caused me to reassess a lot of things. At the same time, a number of people in my life, uh, my father had left my mother after 45 years of marriage and she was trying to figure out what her life was worth. You know, someone who had been a housewife her whole life to be deserted at age, you know, in her late 60s. Uh, and, uh, you know, my mother-in-law had recently been widowed. And just so all of these, you know, women mostly uh, in this kind of state of suspension and waiting and to see what life was going to bring. I mean, that was what the hanged man me meant for me. I mean, there was a certain amount of 
suffering, but the suffering wasn't primary. What was primary was uh, suspension from the previous way of life and then thinking about it. In the middle of all this, I go down to Mexico, I have my tarot read, and the tarot card I get is the tarot card of the hanged man, who if you've seen it, it's someone hanging upside down from one foot. He's not dead, and he doesn't even seem particularly unhappy. Like he's, he's just using the inverted perspective to reflect on his situation. And yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking. I didn't mean the Hanged Men poems to be that dark. Right. Uh -huh. Well, you know what's interesting? Uh, Rita Dove was here yesterday and talked about how with poetry, you, you can listen to it and you can absorb it and you can hear it, but you have to sort of rise up to meet it. Yeah. So as I read your poems, I found myself digging into some of the background elements that I could discover, and there's yeah. many that I probably don't know that uh -huh. influence you in these thinking. And that leads down paths that I wasn't expecting to go down as I read your poems and Google searches that I wasn't expecting to make and yeah. discoveries about other work. Uh -huh. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about poetry. For you, what, do you like explaining some of the, these elements that are part of your poems or do you hope <laughs> that we just go find out? I mean, element. I'm hoping that both happen. I mean, I don't expect people to get everything I put into the poem. Some things I put in just for personal reasons. Uh, but I do like, you know, people often tell me that my work is very dense and works on a lot of levels simultaneously. You know, part of that maybe has to do with my legal training because, you know, in law, you come across a phrase like cruel and unusual punishment, for example. And cruel and unusual punishment is not the dictionary definition. It's the history of all of the ways in which that phrase has been used. You get into hundreds of years of cases and examples and what that means. And it's like you're reading in hypertext. And, um, and something about that idea has always been attractive to me, especially I think in this book where I was thinking about a, a lot about words and the accumulation of meaning around words, uh, the accumulation of meaning around concepts like black acre or property or the body or shame um, and what that meant. Yeah, well, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And the book has uh, been a, a revelation for me. It's been <laughs> a wonderful you. year for you. Yeah. Uh, National Book Award nomination this year as well. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to see what comes next from you, Monica. Yeah, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. I, uh, I wrote something in the wake of the election that was uh, very much in the same vein that we were talking about. Uh, it was, um, I think that after the election, I was kind of thinking as many people were like, I have so many things to worry about and what should I worry about and ethically, how can I, distinguish worrying about my friends and my neighbors and my family from worrying about what's happening across the world and what's happening, you know, in America, outside of America, on our borders, uh, in other states, all of these things. Um, and so I thought about the word mine and how that, you know, how that impulse to kind of wall yourself off is interesting. And mine, of course, has four, uh, I wrote a poem that has four separate meanings of the word mine. You know, one is obviously the possessive, one is mine, like, uh, you know, like digging in the earth to get gold or something. Uh, one is mine, like a landmine, and one is mine, which is to undermine. And was thinking about the ways in which those word histories and meanings come together into this, this word that seemed to, have various facets to it, facets of a problem. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Fascinating. Uh -huh. I, I want to see that now, <laughs> so we'll have to look for it. Actually, PBS uh, published it uh, for the NewsHour. Uh, I should know that because <laughs> yes. we're going to do it with Jeff Brown in just a few <laughs> yeah, minutes, exactly. Monica. All right, well, listen, thank you so much for being here. Monica yeah. Yoon, the book is Black Acre. Congratulations on your year. All right, thank you.